premise of this presentation is that gravity is not a field or bent spacetime. We have two major thoughts on gravity. One is Newton's idea. Newton saw gravity as a field, an area, volume around all objects. This field was somehow created by matter, mass, and all objects respond to each other's field and move toward each other. The second one is Einstein's idea. It's to Einstein gravity was spent space-time. This spending was somehow caused by matter, mass, and all moving or stationary objects follow this curvature. I'm going to have a different perspective on gravity. First, I will look at Newtonian mechanics flow with Mercury's orbit, and then we'll look at relativity's flow with the galaxy rotation curve. Next, I'll modify your, our concept of space and space-time and show how this modification solves Mercury's precession and the galaxy rotation curve problems. Then I'll propose a new description of gravity, a physical description of gravity. Gravity, as described by Newton, predicted planetary motion with amazing accuracy. The only minor failure was Mercury's perihelion precession, the shifting of the point where Mercury is closest to the Sun. Unknown to Newton, this precession hinted at another level of physics. You see, Planets do not follow perfectly circular orbits. Their orbits are oval, squashed, uh, slightly off-center. Mercury, which is the closest planet to the Sun, has the most elliptical or eccentric orbit. And that's a dotted line you see here. This would be a planet that's in a perfect cir perfectly circular orbit. Now, I'm going to have to define a couple of terms. Number one is eccentricity. And eccentricity is a number that represents the deviation of a circle from being perfect. A perfect circle has an eccentricity of zero. As the circle becomes more oval, more elliptical, its eccentricity increases, and this eccentricity in orbit results in a changing distance between planets and their sun. And when a planet is closest to the sun, we call that the perihelion. Well, Mercury's perihelion, that's the blue dot you see here, it shifts around the Sun. And astronomers had measured this precession at 575 arc seconds per century. But Newtonian mechanics predicted only a precession of 532 arc seconds per century. Relativity was able to mathematically explain Mercury's and most of the other planets' precession with greater accuracy by assuming the Sun's mass bends space-time, whatever that means. So here it is. This is Mercury's precession, it's measure of 5.74 arc seconds. Okay. And theoretically, according to Newton was 5.3 arc seconds per year. With, Newton, with Einstein's relativity, it became 5.75. 5.74, 5.75. That's excellent. The problem is when you apply relativity to the precession of Venus, the values diverge. So Venus's precession was measured at 2.04 according to relativity, should have been 10.75. So it's theoretically was about five times greater than was measured. Now scientists attribute this discrepancy to Venus having an almost circular orbit. But this explanation fails with Neptune because Neptune orbit is also almost perfectly circular. But the precession is the of all the planets. So let's take a look at these two planets see, and see what they do. 
In the case of Venus, the eccentricity is 0 0.007. That makes almost a circle. Neptune is 0 0.009. Remember, zero is perfect circle. 0 0.009 is almost a circle. But if you look at the precession as measured for Venus, it was 2.04. For Neptune, same kind of orbit, 0 0.036 almost 50 times higher than, Mer than uh, Venus. If you try calculating it, for Venus you get 10.75, and for Neptune, well, it even doubles it. So, did relativity really help? And there's another problem. With the exception of Mercury, eccentricity and precessions, they seem to be related. As, pre as the precession goes up, eccentricity goes up also. As one goes down, the other one goes down too. Up and down. They seem to be related. Something happened at Cert uh, Saturn because the eccentricity is very, it's not much, but the precession is very high. And afterwards, if you look at it, the precession before Saturn falls below the eccentricity. Here it kind of flips itself around, just like Mercury. Now, we know what eccentricity depends on. It depends on planetary formation. What does precession depend on? Well, scientists don't really know what causes precession. It may be caused by the gravitational influence of all the planets on each other. It could be Ben's best time. It could be a vastly more complex three-body problem. And another problem with relativity is that stars in the galaxy's arms move faster than predicted by relativity. It's called the galaxy's rotation curve problem. According to relativity and Newtonian mechanics, away from a concentration of matter, of mass, gravity should decrease at the rate of 1 over r squared, meaning stars should move slower as you move away from the galactic center bulge. But they don't. They should be doing this, should go, going up, and then should be going slower and slower and slower. But in the reality, it goes up, and it keeps going up. So there's a problem here. The, the, pretty, uh, the, uh, the measured speed is different from the predicted, the calculated speed. And that raises quite a few questions. Why is the relationship between eccentricity and precession so high? Why is Venus measure precession so high compared to Neptune when they both have the same circular orbit? Why does relativity predict a still higher precession for Venus? And why don't stars slow down in the distant uh, in the galaxy distant outer arms as predicted by relativity? Could these hint at another physics level? Well, these are beliefs about gravity. We always believe that gravity came out of the ground and pulled everything downwards. Gravity was a pull. Now we believe that planets roll, kind of roll around bent space-time. Or I've seen videos where time causes gravity. Either way, how matter tells space-time to warp is undefined. In other words, how does matter know where space-time is and vice versa? In reality, we don't know what gravity is, except for a label of bent space-time. We can only measure its effect on matter and energy. So, I'm going to give you a different perspective. In a previous video, I explained that space has a density. It's granular. I call each space grain an axiom. You might want to call it space grain, space time grain, or string, whatever you want to call it. it. Doesn't matter. It's a label. As we approach a large mass, such as the sun, space density around it rises. And this density increase coupled to space time that tells matter planets which way to go. And 
as always, moving away from the center of matter, space density drops at 1 over r squared. So let's look at precession as a density effect. Because of Mercury's eccentric orbit and the higher space density closer to the Sun, as Mercury approaches perihelion, it slows down and changes direction slightly toward the Sun. Light does the same thing when it goes from one medium into another. When light enters an optically denser object, it instantly slows down and changes direction. But that's because it's a sudden change in density. When it comes out, it speeds up and returns the original direction. Well, we don't know that for certain, because we only measured this direction change for short distances, and light moves at very, very fast speeds. So we don't really know if the new direction of light changes at longer distances. In other words, this line right here may not be parallel to this line here. So just like light, as Mercury exits into less dense space, it slowly speeds up and changes direction. And we say our orbit precesses. But of course, light's much faster than Mercury. Now, looking at this diagram, there's a major error. In this diagram, light travels in straight lines, but curves when close to the sun. So you have a straight line here, a straight line here, but when it gets to this point here, close to the sun, it bends. In reality, light travels in straight lines only when it's away from gravity. When light is in the gravitational field, it bends. And that's regardless of the strength of the gravitational field. If it's a strong field, it bends a lot. If it's a weak field, it bends a little. Uh, and the question becomes now, is the energy loss when the planet goes into denser space? Well, meteors entering the Earth's atmosphere, they lose energy by colliding with air molecules, and their path changes, they curve. Planets crossing into denser region of space slow down and change direction, but they don't lose any energy. Their orbit changes directions, they precess, and when they come out from the denser region, they slowly return to the original speed, but slightly different directions, just like light refraction. So let's take a look at the precession of Venus and Mercury now, and Neptune now. Because Venus has a low eccentricity orbit, space density is almost uniform, but high, giving Venus a low precession rate and a lower than calculated orbital speed. Compared to Neptune, the high density in Venus orbit raises Venus precession. In the case of Neptune's orbit, it has a low eccentricity. Space density is almost uniform, but lower, giving Neptune a very low precession and a higher orbital speed. This, the idea of uh, a lower speed for Venus and a higher speed of Neptune, is my prediction. As for the stars in the galaxy's arms, they seem to be moving faster than predicted. Could it be that stars inside the galaxy, the galaxy bulge move slower than predicted because of the high space density in the bulge itself? In other words, stars in the galaxy's arm experience less density, therefore they move faster than anticipated. So the galaxy rotation curve it's actually an inverted space density graph. Higher density, lower density. It's inverted. Our planet's rotation curve differs from the galaxy's curve. But in our solar system, planets below Saturn weave in and out of higher density space, creating what we call precession. Saturn's orbit is the inflection point, the point where the density changes from higher to lower. So, having established, to my satisfaction, that space has a density, 
how does this density create gravity? The premise. Well, that involves a different interpretation of space-time. I know this is goes against the rules in physics. And the concept of universal expansion, which is a recent concept, never really explored for understanding gravity. Relativity was developed before universal expansion was known. Universal expansion stretches space, which enlarges the universe. To prevent drips in the fabric of space, space-time is created instantaneously, constantly, everywhere, simultaneously. During space-time creation, time flashes for a moment, an instant, and then vanishes. But the space portion of space-time, what I call actions, remain. They make up dark matter. So if you look at this here, it's continuous. This will be a space-time, space, this, this is space-time before time comes off. The, the, uh, the wave coming off of it, that's time. So what happens is it's created, time goes off, then everything stops. So space-time is a momentary phenomenon created by universal expansion everywhere. Now, because of the higher space density, universal expansion cannot stretch the space around large masses as easily as space away from such masses. So since space-time away from masses expands faster than space around masses, the faster expanding space pushes objects toward slower expanding space. And that's how space-time knows where matter is. We call this push gravity. So gravity is not a pull, it's a, it's a push from space-time itself toward planets and larger masses. So I've shown you this before. Let's say we have an object here. We have space-time being created on both sides of it. As they're created, both, both sides, they push toward against each other, so the object stands still. Space-time at this point here expands faster than space-time in here. Because the expansion is higher on this side than the other side, the object gets a slight push in this direction. And then another push, and another push, and another push, and eventually, this is what we call gravity. The object gets pushed toward an object, and a larger mass, whether it's a sun or a planet or whatever. Now, if you look at black holes, that's an extreme gravity case. A black hole is just space with a very high action density. And universal expansion cannot stretch space-time that's inside the event horizon. The event horizon is just a point where the density stops increasing. Therefore, space-time cannot be created inside the black hole. Space-time away from the black hole pushes everything toward the black hole. But there's no space-time to push outwards. This makes it impossible for anything to escape a black hole. There's no outward pressure. So, the higher action's density of space around massive bodies affects the velocity and orbit of masses around them. This causes planetary precession and the rotation, the galaxy rotation curve problem. An even universal expansion caused by density differences in area around masses as compared to space away from masses pushes objects from high expansion area to low expansion areas, and we call this push gravity.